Hello, all, and welcome to Office Hours. It's great to have you here. If you're watching on YouTube, you can find out more about what we do on officehours.global. Our first hour is a general discussion of production and IT-related topics where we answer audience-submitted questions. Second hour is a typically deeper dive into a topic. Today, a good friend of our show, Felipe Baez, is going to be here to tell us about his early experiences with the new Blackmagic Resolve NLE software running on iOS. So, an NLE for your tabnet, and if you're brave enough Enough, perhaps, or have small enough fingers, your phone. Uh, Mitch, that's going to be the show later, but what have you got for us today with questions? First off is Kenneth Jones from Seattle, Washington, asking, the analog pots on my mixer become noisy, like, <laughs> I'm willing to disassemble it, but what spray-on product might I use to clean and lubricate those controls? And we're going to start with Guy Cochran this morning. Yeah, we sell a lot of a product called uh, keg um, deoxid, but also keg fader lube. So you want to look up uh, just on the good old Google or in their webs, a uh, keg fader lube, spray some of that on, and that should help clean up some of those uh, scratchy faders. Cool. Uh, Mitch, what do you use? I use the same thing Guy's mentioning, the keg uh, detox uh, fader lube. What I would suggest doing, it, it depends on the kind of pot you're cleaning. It could be a sealed pot, which means you're not going to get to spray anything on it. But if it's a, like a long throw fader, like a Penny and Giles or something like that, um, you can disassemble it to the extent where you can get in there and get to those little wire uh, pieces that traverse the uh, uh, the conductive material that makes it a volume control. But um, I would try it on one first and then adjust that knob a few times just to see how it works because I'm sure there's some restrictions on certain types of materials. But uh, generally, I see that keg out there. Uh, John Preto. Exactly the same thing. I used to work at an electronics repair shop, tuner wash. That's what we used to use. Okay, so you've got consensus. Three people say exactly the same thing. Let's move on to the next question. From Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, PA. Josh says, what file uploading service will allow a client to record a video on their phone and upload the file? Services that require creating or joining accounts can do this, but is there a lower friction method available to anyone with an invitation link? Alex is going to help us out, Alex. You know, I read the first half of that and raised my hand, and I was like, it's like you hit too quickly on Jeopardy. So I, I actually, <laughs> you know, so it's just, I looked at it, I was like, invitation link. I mean, because the easy, one of the things that we do is we tell people to just upload to YouTube because we can pull it down. If they're going to do an H.264 record, we're like, if you have a YouTube account, just upload it there because we can use Downey and just pull it off the off the web. <laughs> so so it's uh, YouTube is one of the ones that we've we've used in the past. I don't know how many there are without that are frictionless. Uh, Sky. Dropbox used to require that you would have to download their app and do all of that management things. But I believe you are able to make an account that people can drop things into on a web base. So I would attempt that. Uh, in fact, that's what I'm trying to do with with my film. So uh, I'm going to try, try to say Dropbox. Alex? If you're on an iPhone, you may be able to share photos, you know, have a shared folder with photos that you invite them to. So I believe that that was one of the newer features that's, that's out there. Okay. Hopefully that gives you some options. Next question. From Nathan Cashin in Oregon City, Oregon, I've started doing some audiobook narration for LibriVox. One of my biggest challenges is mouth noise, the sound of the tongue, saliva, etc. Yuck. Any initial tips to reduce mouth noise? He has a Heil PR40 with pop filter CL1, Zoom H6, and have isotope. Mitchell. Um, I, I, I want to point you in a different direction here. Um, mostly mic technique is going to avoid those things. To try to reduce them or remove them after the fact uh, means that you may be affecting other parts of your voice. So um, if you're hearing the sound of your tongue, you got to move your tongue away from the microphone or turn the microphone slightly to, uh, to edge. Uh, as far as saliva goes, um, a nice drink of water uh, will help you with that beforehand. Don't eat uh, things that uh, that'll tend to make your uh, your mouth kind of noisy, like uh, pastries, milk, things like that. Will reduce most of those things will reduce reduce those noises at the source. And Alex. Yeah, I agree with the water and sometimes warm tea. Um, the I always have my mic to the side, and I, I find that it cuts off a lot of the a lot of those things. And then Isotope does have some tools that will filter some of that out as well. Uh, it will take a little bit of the high end out, so you want to be kind of careful of of making that work. And Nathan, the only advice I'm going to give you, you're the talent here, and listen to yourself on something where you can hear yourself very clearly. All of these noises are being created by something you are physically doing. 
And if you want to stop doing it, you can. I'm not saying this is easy or whatever, but part of the skill of being an announcer is to learn the subtle techniques of being able to control popped P's and TH splashing sounds and working with your microphone at the right angles and the right distances to eliminate things you don't want it to hear. But always listen back to yourself and you should be able to hear them first. And when you hear them, you can figure out ways to not make those sounds. Just saying. Uh, Next question. From Chris Widener, Lafayette, Indiana. Chris asks, Apple Music now offers a karaoke mode. Licensing rights aside, other than small get-togethers, what would be the utility of this feature? Nigel. I think it encourages more younger people maybe to pick up an Apple TV or that sort of streaming device. Um, I have to tell you, though, I will be going to less holiday parties because the risk of this being generally deployed is fairly scary. And Alex. It's so, so I... I a lot of us have talked about the fact that Apple could do this, and especially when the lyrics came out, you were like, why aren't they just creating something that will take out the voice and let people sing with it? I think that you'll find that people will like to use this in the car while they're singing. They can now get rid of the voice and they can sing with their favorite song. I think that beyond karaoke, uh, I think people will enjoy just doing it, you know, just for fun on their own. They won't they won't necessarily need it to be um, something else. And so I think, it's, I think it's, it's a great thing. I do think that Nigel's right that it is now gone to a... Everybody can do it with an Apple TV. So um, I, I expect to hear lots of karaoke uh, with my kids, with their friends, um, you know, coming soon. Yeah. I think there's going to be a big rash of it. And it'll be fun. As long as it's fun, the people who are yeah. serious about karaoke, and I had a friend once who was dead <laughs> serious about it. She went to all the places. She had a great voice and she was a karaoke star. They will always take this super seriously. And <laughs> this is not for them. This is for everybody else who wants to have fun with karaoke and I think it's a great idea. Mitch, you had a thought? Yeah, I've been banned from a few bars for singing <laughs> Bohemian Rhapsody. You get the Scatamouche part. <laughs> Just Can imagine. you do the Fandango Thunderbolts and Lightning? Very, very frightening. Yes. Yeah, I, I can't even get that out of my head now. All right. All right. We need to move on. <laughs> We've been earwormed. Sorry about that, audience. All right. It's next question time. Sorry. Daniel Goldstein from Baltimore, Maryland. What are current best practices for using Max for live production without having to worry about those infernal orange and green security notification dots? Alex. I think you have to have either a computer on, I believe it's Big Sur, uh, you know, needs to be, you need to keep it. It's one of those the classic things we do with a Mac where we don't update because Apple did something horrible. Um, and so this is one of those cases where Apple did something horrible and they are they seem pretty unrepentant about it. I think they've taken it out of Ventura so that there, there's not any way to, um, there's not any way to avoid it. The only way to avoid it right now is to use an SDI output. So you can't use the HDMI output of your computer, um, but I don't believe that the, that the, the, the orange dot appears on the SDI outputs. So you have to kind of use a, a pro level output to avoid the dot. And there you go. Next question. From John Nichols in Concord, California, asking, what is your favorite sub $500 microphone for a singer? The only thing that shocks me about this question is that we didn't have 17 people weighing in on it, even though we only have about 10 here. Uh, let's start with Mitchell Hill. It, it, it's microphone religion, folks. Um, I have to ask you, John, whether it's for a live event or a recording studio. A uh, guy was discussing that with us beforehand, and that would really change that decision. Um, if it's for a, a recording studio, we would try to, well, I would try to get you to go just a wee ha- bit higher and buy a Neumann, uh, maybe a TLM, something like that. Uh, it's going to cost you a little bit more. Below that, you've got lots of choices uh, as far as handheld, and it might be visually stunning to use a Sennheiser or a uh, SM58, which is only about 40 or $50. So you've got a lot of choice there in between. And uh, Alex? Yeah, I mean, under $500, I think the one that SM7B is probably the one that most people would, would uh, pick for a studio. Uh, and uh, the SM58 is probably the most classic on on, uh, I had somebody, I had somebody, uh, we, we were doing a job and they were looking at the video and they were like, why did you put that cheap mic up? You know, and I was like, that's an SM58. It's like whatever, like 90% of the people use for the last 50 years. <laughs> like it's not, I thought it's not, not a Radio Shack mic. It's a, it's pretty, it's a pretty good mic. So uh, anyway, they're, they're both of those are from Sure and they're, they're both good mics. I think, I think the, I was the actual, watching. I think they're actually the same capsule, by the way. Yeah. They're just different. Um, same capsule, just different. Uh, different windscreens. Housings and so on yeah. and so forth. Yeah. 
I'm I'm shocked. I was watching something on Sunset Sound, the recorders down uh, in Los Angeles that recorded so many of the biggest hits of the 90s. And they were showing old pictures. And here's like Aerosmith and Prince and all these people in there recording their hits. And about 40 or 50 percent of the time, they're singing into an SM58 handheld, not because it is the absolute finest mic in the world, but because the performers are used to performing with that and getting the live energy of their performances performing live into it. And that's what they wanted to capture. So go figure. Next question. From Hazma Kajar in Cape Town, South Africa, asking any possibility of using video pencil on iPad as an input camera into ATEM as a Lumi key, currently using Mimo Live to deal with NDI and video pencil. Camera then becomes Mimo Live. How can I bypass Mimo Live? Alex. I, you know, we have to talk to, to uh, Michael about that because I, I think we're getting close to a fact. So, so the new video pencil that just came out has the ability to have a camera capture, you know, that, that goes back to the back to it, you know, from the Mac to the um, to the iPad. And if the iPad only pushed out the black and white image, you know, out of the HDMI, theoretically that could be plugged straight in. So you could end up with that. I it's still a little bit of a convoluted uh, connection there, but but we're getting very close. I, I have to, I have to, I haven't had time. Next week I have a lot more time, and I'm going to be playing with video pencil. We'll we'll, we'll, we'll stay on that. Would that be the theoretically the world's easiest telestrator rig? Uh, possibly. You know, I, I have to test it first. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I, yeah. No, understood. With but the I will, what I will say is that, you know, um, what Michael has really nailed is the the pen movement and the pen quality is super high. You know, like he really, um, you know, it's, and so as someone who has one that was written a long time ago with mine, uh, you'll notice that, you know, the one that I have, if I go too fast, you'll see, you know, these, these, uh, points here. Oh, little vertices there. Yeah, little yeah. vertices there. And and so I, I purposefully, usually when I do it, you'll see me draw slowly because it's it's, a, it's how fast it samples. Oh yeah, that's much um, so And so, so it's, a, it's a time thing and, and Michael's gotten done that much better than I did. <laughs> so, so anyway, so, so, uh, so I, I, I'm definitely looking at it like if I could just, what I really want is to have some kind of thing that just had HDMI in and out of that USB-C, like a little connector and then just use the iPad the way I'm using it now, but we haven't seen that yet. That, that's not a, a video pencil problem. That's an iPad hardware problem, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Nice. All right, the next question. From Richard Lavery in Belfast asking, community members John Barker and Lucas Herman launched Dash Master 2K today. What, do you, what does the panel think and how might they be using it? Sky, do you know this? I just started looking at it this morning when the questions were being posted. It's awesome. Of course, anything that John creates, he's a diligent developer. His his interfaces are, are nice and clean. But I also noticed that the templates are brilliant of putting up your screens where you want them automatically. And in, in the I went to the price point, and while free is nice, the 30, what is it, $35 a year for uh hundreds of dashboards and and on 10 different devices, the amount of time that I would save just going click, click, and my screen is exactly the way I need it and all the windows are where they're supposed to be and all the different apps, that's a that's a huge time saving and value. So, hey, Sky, for the people who might not be familiar with this, and I'm one of them, can you give us kind of an overview of what Dash what, Masters? Well, I'm still I'm still exploring it. Please take a, take a look at the uh, the link yourself, but it it what I'm understanding it does is it takes your different apps and automatically puts them into different locations on your screen. And consequently, you've got your um, your different functionality all placed out for you in a nice orderly manner. And again, I'm still exploring the different templates that he's got so that you can, um, you know, you've got overlapping windows for overlapping I, applications. I think we should just reach out to John Barker and have him come on. I think that'd, that'd be, be brilliant. That'd Josh, be great. Josh, we'll just, we'll just, I think it, it looks really cool. Uh, it's got the classic uh, John Barker great taste um, of, of how it looks. Um, let's just get him on for a second hour. So let's see if we can do that in the next couple of weeks. Perfect. But no, and no by reason the way, John, to speculate. If you're watching, if you had told us ahead of time, we would ha have had you on this week. <laughs> just, like, just, just let you know, like you have a free invitation if you're releasing, if you or Jonas and a couple other folks uh, in our group uh, and Michael, Michael Forrest, if you're releasing something and you're in our group, we'll make time. 
You know, so so just 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 give us a little bit of a heads up. Give Josh a heads up, and we'd love to have you on and and have you like we did with the day after Sound Devices released their uh, their new uh, receiver. We had them on, so we're we're ready to make time for folks in the family. There you go. Next question. Bo Cordell in Charleston, South Carolina. The Chargers posted a behind-the-scenes video of their control room production. What are your takeaways? And there's a link to it. Sky? Yes, I think everybody should go watch this because it's as close to the real-life experience of being in that uh, experience. And having been on those crews, you do hear the banter in the back, but you're very focused on your task. So this is a great experience uh, video. It's it's fairly long. And the other realization is that it's in a brand new stadium. I mean, that stadium is state of the art, only a couple of years old. So it's got all of the toys, the new toys, the new whistles, but it's still got the fun attitude behind it. Alex. It's imperative that everybody that watches office hours goes watch this video. <laughs> so, you know, like you should really watch this um, because it is, it just really gives you a sense of the scale. You know, you don't, it's not like it's a tutorial on how to use any of the things, but it's a, it sh shows the scale of what it takes. I've gotten to work on these crews a little bit here and there, and I've been a tiny little cog, <laughs> you know, in the, in the thing. And, and just to see the whole, like what it takes every single game to play um, is pretty amazing. So definitely check out this video. Nice. All right. Next question. From TJ Asher in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hey, guy. Can the aperture lights be controlled by an app on a Mac? Guy? Uh, yeah, they sure can. So here's my Mac M1, and uh, Mac M1s can run uh, Apple uh, iOS apps. So if I uh, make this a little bit bigger, you can see the app. And uh, I thought that you needed the Citus link. Like there's a module. I thought you had to buy another thing to control this light, which the one that I have here is a, a P300. Uh, let me actually cut to that real quick so you guys can see what the fixture looks like. So the fixture is the large one that is uh, up up top there. So I don't know if you can see my arm, but it's that large one right there. And so this app, now we can control, uh, let's say we want to control the intensity. Look at how smooth this dimming is. So now that's that light off. Here's that light coming on. And it's got an egg crate on the front. So that's full tilt i think mickey had me put it at about 40. you can also change uh, uh, any color of the rainbow so there, there's cto ctb but there's gels you can go hsi so we can go in any color party gels oh yeah and if you want party mode there is effect party lights start so now we need some boom, boom, bouncing you get the idea it does work so nice how much does that light cost? Uh, I'd have to look it up. It's it's not cheap. This yeah. is the Aperture P three hundred C. I think it's about eighteen hundred bucks. I want to say sixteen ninety nine. And then uh, it depends on if you get it with the hard case or not. Yeah, it's less than the Gemini's and things like that. So, but still affordable in that class. All right, I think that takes care of uh, TJ. Hope that helped you. Next question. Nathan Cashian in Oregon City, Oregon. Is there a preferred ideal workflow for editing an audio plus video podcast to separate feeds? Is it fine to bounce the final MP3 out of Final Cut Pro, or is there a good reason to do a final edit in a dedicated digital audio workstation? Sky will start us off. Well, historically, yes, that bouncing your audio out to an audio professional that specifically understands all of the nuances and has the tools in their DAW and then bouncing it back into the edit uh, uh, to just put it underneath as a finished sweetened audio file. That's the history that I come from, but I come from a, a factory of, of doing this video production with audio that has a specialist behind it. Alex? If the audio recording is really clean, I, I think that you could probably just push it out of Final Cut and most people wouldn't notice um, it being, there's a lot of tools in Final Cut for audio already and a lot of your plugins and everything else will work there as well so you can do a lot in final cut um, by itself um, the real thing that you get into is that there's just the, the ability to view the files and to um, do automation so if you're going to by automation i mean like silencing things that are between the, the different mics like if you only have one person it's a little less but but pulling silences in um adding you know, small curves or doing any kind of fine tools. I don't think that the tools in Final Cut are as good as Logic, you know, specifically. I mean, to, those are the two that I use. <laughs> so so I, I think that that would be a little bit um, different. Also, if you 
I, I will say that if you did it, and I'm going to start experimenting with this, I haven't really done a lot of audio in, in, I've been doing a bunch of the podcast stuff that I do in, in Logic. I'm going to do it in Resolve just to play with it, play with Fairlight. And in Fair, I, I think that the Fairlight tools are probably robust enough that you could do everything in Resolve um, without, without going anywhere else. Uh, you're, you mentioned kind of having brains on things, and I think I stand with Sky in terms of the fact that if you are bringing in a brain who understands audio to sweeten things, I think that's always a good idea. Skills are hard to come that's by. That's always better. Yeah. I yeah. Mean, having a professional audio better. person do it. Yeah, exactly. Absolutely. In terms of the actual tools, though, I will just note that every piece of audio that goes through a Mac goes through exactly the same algorithms, the core audio uh, generators, things like that, that... Um, are universal across. So if you're saying, is there something about running it through a program A versus program B inside your Mac that is different qualitatively? The answer is no, they're all calling it's, core audio. They're all doing things. It is the access that you are allowed from the designer of the software. Right. And what, what Alex and other people are talking about is did the software designer think that you were going to be needing deep access and create an environment for that? But the actual audio quality is going to remain the same no matter what tool you use. I said famously that I've been doing voiceover work for radio for about the past nine years, and it all goes through Final Cut. Why? Because it's basically the same exact algorithms that Logic has. And if they're good enough for pop albums and billion selling pop albums they're good enough for my radio work so it's not the tool it's the person being able to use the tool and having the 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 software tools that they need to execute their vision that is always the differentiator here mitch has a thought and so does sky yeah just a warning uh, be careful when you're using mp3 files because you've already got a lossy uh, file there and if you decompress it uh, and edit it and then re-encode it to MP3, you just lost another uh, bit of uh, info. So Yeah, it looked like he was saying mastering, it. bounce the final MP3 out of Final Cut. So that shouldn't be, if, if that's your last stage, that shouldn't be a problem. But point well taken. But if it brings Sky, it into a DAW, then it has to be de uh, decompressed. That's true. If you're submastering to an MP3 and then sending that to your audio person, that is not a good Yeah, I think he was just talking about publishing to MP3. Yeah, I think so as well. And, Scott, and that's, again, nope. yeah, it's the exact same comment yep, is yep. anytime you do a compression, then you open it back up. It's like silly putty. You're going to make a uh, bad, op bad video, bad audio, even worse. So yeah, that's, that's, that's a challenge to your keep your compression as to the last thing as possible. Yeah. That's always good advice. Anyway, there you go. Let's move on to the next question. Tony Tang from Chicago, Illinois, when displaying a keynote presentation, for example, from a max HDMI output to the HDMI input of an ATEM mini, the shadows and highlights are clipped. It's probably a 0 to 255 full range signal into a 16 to 235 limited range input. Has anyone found a fix? Alex. So we're going to test a fix next week. Um, and I think that what we're looking at is the idea of taking the Mac, running it through, going full screen with uh, Zoom, uh, running the Mac's uh, HDMI into the ATEM, and then looking at it in Zoom, and then color correcting the Mac's uh, output, the profile, for that throughput. So you'd build a black magic profile and then you would raise the blacks up and, and, and bring the and bring the whites down just a little bit. Uh, I'm gonna actually use a you know an one of the X right you know con, you know correctors to see if that it'll do it it should do it automatically and give us that full range back into it. Now it will that will be for that output <laughs> because if you put it into something else it'll look like it's low lower contrast. Um, the uh, thing that we are going to encourage you to do probably sometime next week, and you'll see it in the email, is to, we're all going to request that um, Zoom, I'm going to encourage all of you to request that Zoom fix this bug. <laughs> so, so this is not a, this is not an ATEM problem. This is a Zoom problem. Um, and it's a bug. And what we need to do is, is ask them to put a button in that will fix that bug. Uh, and we're all going to ask at the same time. So don't do it yet. <laughs> but Prepare we're gonna, the brigade. <laughs> yeah, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna experiment with, you know, the, um, uh, we, we're probably going to start picking something every week that, that, that bothers our production and just, and, um, and kind of push down on, 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 you know, making big requests of companies, uh, by the hundreds, <laughs> so, so, you know, and, you know, like, it. you know, like, so, so we're going to, you know, we've done this before and, you know, you know, you, you notice that universe uh, is now, you know, there's an interface that works with zoom. Your universe wouldn't give liminal the time of day until we made more requests in one 
in 15 minutes. I got this from the direct builder. We made more requests in 15 minutes than they had had in the history of the company. It's so, a benign and positive use of power. Let's yeah. go for it. <laughs> so, so we, we, I think we're, we're getting to the point where we need to kind of make, make some requests and see if we can't move. Again, it's, it's not for us. It's for moving the, you know, and there's a lot of people that aren't in office hours that this is affecting and they don't know why. And so it's our job to kind of point out in with clarity to companies that, hey, it'd be really good if you fix this. <laughs> so, so, and, and by doing a lot of it, it suddenly shows up at least in the discussions. So, um, so stay tuned. And I think for we're that. doing them a service. There's so much technical competence here that we will know what is just, actually a problem and what is just a, I like this. That's my story. I'm sticking to it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question. Well done. Brett Bilal from Appleton, Wisconsin. Does the panel trust using dummy batteries for constant power to a camera? I don't want my Sony a7 IV to overheat from all day use with a battery and USB-C, but I've also read Amazon horror stories of dummy batteries completely smoking Sony cameras. Alex. I used the dummy battery once and that camera doesn't work anymore. <laughs> so, 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 like I would say, no. So I would, don't I want. Use it. It <laughs> right. was a long time. It was a long time ago, but we bought we bought one. It was for a Sony, and we it wasn't an A7. It was I don't remember which one it was, but it was it required one in there. And we we're like, oh, this will work great, and it just shorted and and it internally and um, melted, and uh, it was Mitchell hard to get out. Hill. We we kept oh. on thinking we would fix it, but we just ended up it just ended up sitting on a shelf for a long time with the battery stuck in it. Mitch Hill. Um, you don't want to buy cheap batteries, just like you don't want to put cheap gas in a Ferrari. Um, you must be careful. Um, I had a similar situation. I am running off a dummy battery in my uh, FX3 right here, right now. And uh, perhaps I've gotten off lucky, but uh, it's been on for the two years uh, so that I've been on uh, office hours. I think if you are careful and you test it, um, you might avoid any you know spectacular sparking uh, revenge from uh, the battery department. Sky. I have that in my uh, Blackmagic 4K. And I used it uh, while I was commuting and traveling, and I, it seemed to be working fine. But I also had a V-mount uh, that it was ad adapted into. So I used it more as an adapter for the V-mount that was attached underneath. I've not heard this. Now I'm warned. Thank you. Um, I had a friend who used to do a lot of time-lapse stuff. And I, it's not on the video thing, so it's not a direct comparison. But he always used Canon's power battery replacements in his long-range uh time-lapse rigs and he had them going for up to a year and never had any problems. So if you are going to, obviously there are certain circumstances where you can get in trouble, but I would only use uh, replacement battery power things that are made by the company that made their original hardware. I would think they would be uh, engineeringly wise enough not to want to put some, their brand on something. I'd never go for a third party and I probably wouldn't buy something off eBay. You definitely don't want to get that Canon battery replacement where the Canon is spelled wrong. That's a bad sign. All right, let's move on to the next question. From Douglas Carmichael, would there be a way to link SPX to a message broker like Mosquito? There's a link to it so that data-driven graphics on screen could automatically update when the data itself changes. Sports scores, for example. Mitchell. Um, yeah, I, I think so. I believe I've seen it in action. I certainly saw it on the uh, Office Hours space launch where it was being done. And uh, there are other products out there that do do that very easily, like the new blue products. But uh, it seems to me that if it isn't uh, working consistently, it's certainly something that could be implemented quickly. Alex? Yeah, it can 100% be done. You might need Tuomo's uh, input to, to do it, but it's, um, you know, or the programming experience, but you can absolutely tie the um, data into, into SPX. And thank you. That moves us to the next question. Todd Raines in Allen, Texas asks, anybody see the latest Hoonigan video, Jim Connor 2022? Quite the stunt driving and video sequences. There's a link to it. Uh, I haven't seen it, Alex. Have you? I, I, I saw it after this was posted and... Uh impressive <laughs> you know like that's all i gotta say it just it, it was uh it's it's uh, amazing to watch a precision driver do what they do well and so um so anyway it's just it's a fun it's a fun little uh, video i'd I recommend uh sitting down after breakfast and just watching a little bit okay it'll get you going in the morning there's a lot of a lot of moving parts there there you go chris uh next question from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. Chris asked, anyone have a Thunderbolt dock with a dual HDMI out that they found had a good port set for a new MacBook Pro? Mitchell. I always look to OWC for these things, and I, I know that I'm a broken record mentioning them all the time, but they have such a wide variety of different types of Thunderbolt 
uh, docks that include that and other things. I used a Thunderbolt dock. That's what they call it. Um, and it has plenty of ports on it for just about anything you can think of. And Alex? Yeah, I think the one you're looking for is the uh, OWC Thunderbolt dock with Thunderbolt 4. So that's the newest one that's out there. And it, I, I do believe it has uh, dual Thunderbolts on it as well. Nice. Uh, next question. Tommy Shantz uh, in St. Paul, Minnesota. Has anyone checked out the new Teams? Uh, it's a Post-it app, and there's a link to it. I, we haven't had anybody raise their hand on that, so I don't know if anybody it's, has. I, what is, I, I recommend, and I broke this rule already, I recommend anything posted with a link comes before 7 o'clock, like significantly before 7. Just wait until the next day and post it in like at in the evening or something. It's really hard during the during the show for the for us to keep up, especially with a smaller panel. It's hard for us to keep up with uh, links. I think we, we, even I posted a link today, but I already knew what I was going to talk about with it. So I was doing a Cochrane. So anyway, so the um, so so that one was a little bit of a cheat. But the uh, but when you have something new, it's just really hard for us to review and answer questions at the same time. Fair enough. Uh, hopefully that answered things. But for post you. it again. Here, we're going to kick it back to you. Post just post it again tomorrow, t tomorrow, like or this evening. Post it this evening or first thing tomorrow morning, just so we have a little, like a lot of us like me, will look at a lot of stuff at 6.30. And so if you post it before 6.30, we're kind of browsing through it and looking at links and stuff like that. So I'd recommend before 6.30 for, for links. All right, let's hit the next question. From Robin Cutshaw in Atlanta, Georgia, asking, Ventura is out for Max. Have you upgraded and what's your experiences? Let's start this off with Guy. A lot of people want to weigh in on this. Yeah, I upgraded uh, my M1 and had a little bit bad uh, experience with hooking up a uh, big RAID array. So I wanted to use MIMO Live to be able to act as a uh, ProRes recorder, essentially. So basically, it's NDI into MIMO Live and then use um, MIMO Live to record. So I needed massive storage because I was using some SSDs that were like one terabyte and chewing through them pretty quick. So I hooked up the... Uh, the uh, thir one I have a couple of these 32 terabyte uh, G rids, and I have them on different systems. And I moved it over, and traditionally it worked, but after the upgrade, it doesn't work. In fact, it uh, had to go through all this driver rigmarole and restarts and restarts, and going into that special mode where you adjust the settings. And uh, I never did get it to work. It just it will not. It, it absolutely will not work. So if you if you're running a G Tech uh, G Studio or G RAID, uh, it will not work. It'll crash your machine every time you try to boot it. So, fair warning. And uh, let's see, who is next here? Uh, Mitchell. Yeah, I wouldn't be in a hurry to upgrade to anything on any type of software, particularly your Mac, uh, because there are all kinds of uh, potential uh, interactions and problems that can happen. Uh, I did Ventura much later, and I did it Monday. And first of all, it's very orange uh, on the uh, the main screen. You can change it, I'm sure. Uh, the other parts are uh, that was a bit of a surprise was that it blew out all my um, Adobe links that I had already uh, loaded in there. Of course, it was no big deal to get them back, but I was a little surprised to see that go away. And Tom Ferguson. Well, I tried something just yesterday, and that was I've got a 2017 iMac with Ventura and my Mac Studio. My Mac Studio has an optical drive, so I went into sharing, and I turned on sharing of the optical drive, and then I went over to the 2017 iMac, and it didn't show up. I called Apple. They're saying, oh, gee, that's odd. And sure enough, they have precluded you sharing optical drives now in the new software. Interesting. Did they, they didn't say anything about that being something that they wanted it to do or not? You say they kind of didn't know at least at that level of tech support? Well, at that level of tech support, she didn't know at first, but then I started reading down through the instructions and there was one small little sentence that says, no, we don't do this on, uh, what was it, Mac OS 10 point whatever or above. Interesting. Okay. So there's still things catching up. Nigel. So I have upgraded uh, my machines. Um, I don't do live production. So I don't, uh, I'm not sure I'd be brave enough to do it on that. I do uh, sort of offline stuff and everything is working fine. But I, I'm sort of latest on most things. So I try and avoid N minus two or three technologies if I can, because uh, the support deprecates very fast when you do. So I upgraded about two weeks ago. And um, the only thing I, I was concerned at first, because my Universal Audio Apollo 
drivers gave me some warnings as they were loading, but in operation, it all works perfectly. So I've had zero problems, but that just goes to show you and what you're hearing here goes to show you. I think everybody, if you're on any kind of deadline or you have mission critical work, it's kind of crazy to do the upgrade until you're really sure that they've worked out all the last little uh, issues and bugs from it, particularly for the kind of work you do in the ar arrangement of your computer. These things are so different for every user that boy, it can snap you. Alex, your thoughts? Uh, the best time to upgrade is February. <laughs> Just so you know, like, so February is the best time to upgrade because uh, the, um, y you, a lot of attention needs to be spent on the next version uh, starting in February. So anything that's going to get done and that's big or changed or whatever is going to be done by the end of January um, in, in the OS, be because then the, the, the teams that work on it are all going to focus on June. <laughs> so, so, so that the thing, they're not going to, you know, nothing other than, nothing other than, than heavy duty problems. So, so I would recommend February is a good time to, I, I upgraded early for the first time in, I don't know, a decade last year, because there was some stuff in Keynote that I really wanted to use and I paid a horrible price for it. So I would, um, I would not recommend that. <laughs> Yeah, that's always the challenge. You know, you, they do something nice and you say, I like to take advantage yeah. of that. And then it breaks three other things. And you, oh. uh, I updated one of my computers and it's already having problems <laughs> so, so, with some of my apps. And so, so I was just kind of like, I, one little Mac mini just got upgraded just to see what, what would happen. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to leave my studio on something a little, little further behind until February. Yeah. Uh, next question. That was a fun chat though. That's how it works. David Brady asks from New York, New York, are there encoder settings that will correct 1080i ingest to 1080p stream? I noticed motion combining artifacts on an event and looking to document signal flow. If we need to throw in a Folsom scaler, I have a few to spare. <laughs> there you go, Alex. Folsom scaler should do a pretty good job and, and because it, I think it does the same thing that the Terranex does, which is so just for, you, for those watching, if you think about a frame, there's two, fr there's basically two frames, there's two fields, and these two fields represent the entire thing, but they're two halves, they're every other line. That's what Interlace does. So, so it's it, to get to 5994, which is what they're doing, it's 5994 um, fields, which is basically, if you think about it, it's two, let me make this a little more clear. It's basically two half frames that are, um, they are uh, 1920 wide, but they are only nine uh, or 540 high. And then, but they're every, but they cover the whole frame and it's kind of stretched down and they do that twice. And then they put them every other, um, they, they grab each frames apart. Now, the problem is, is that if you try to combine those, you get exactly what David was talking about. The, it's the interlacing that goes down the edge or aliasing that goes along edges. And you really only see it when there's movement, you'll see a little bit. And that's a lot of times if anyone's ever worked with me and I'm, and you're sending me a signal I haven't seen before, I'll say, do this. And the reason I'm asking you to do that with your hands is I'm looking for interlace. <laughs> like this is an old thing that we used to do. Like, is the is that camera feeding me progressive or or interlace? I just want you to do that with your hands or or go like this, you know. And um, and you'll see me do it too. I'll rock back and forth or I'll, I'll go like this. And that both test the bandwidth as well as test whether I'm getting interlace or, or progressive. The Folsom, because it's a scaler, and I believe that the Terranex both don't try to combine those frames. What they figured out was they could do a um, their scaler was better than the interlacer. And so what they do is they just throw one of the fields away and, and then scale it. Now, the problem is if you're trying to go from 5994 um, progressive to 50i, or I mean 5994i to 5994 P, they have to make up frames where every, they have to make up, they mean, half the frames have to be made up and, and that's that doesn't look as good. But if you're going from 5994i to 2997, which is exactly half, Usually you can get something that looks really good. Um, so it's just a matter of the frame rate that you're trying to get back to and whether it's going to have to create new frames in between. And those every other frame won't look as good. So that's the thing to kind of keep in mind as you do that. But the Terranex does a pretty good job. The uh, Oddly enough, I, I, and I haven't tested it with the HDRs. I know the FS2s from AJA try to do the combination. It never really was as, as good to, do, to, to go from interlace to progressive. Mitchell, you had a thought? Yeah, I agree with Alex. Uh, when you have to manufacture frames from going I to P, um, it's a little more co uh, uh, pr problematic. Most of the networks are 1080i, uh, so that's probably why he's having a, a little issue there. But I usually like to bring it into After Effects because it allows me to do a little uh, motion blurring or doing other things if I'm having problem uh, with uh, artifacting from uh, creating frames that weren't there. Okay, let's move on to the next question. 
And it's from Alex Lindsay in Nevada, California. Has anyone seen Freya Homer's The Continuity of Splines? That sounds interesting, Alex. So this was just released yesterday. Freya, Freya Homer is, is she's got a YouTube channel and wow, <laughs> it's just amazing. So she's got, she had one of the beauty of Beast, uh, the beauty of Bezier's, which is, was put out about a year ago. And this one's the continuity of splines. This, these take her like a year. It's like an hour long of animated how splines work, how they are calculated. It is super geeky and just amazing eye candy. I think Guy has it here. He's, he's showing just little bits of the animation there. Hopefully we can throw that into the program. The, um, it is uh, unbelievable uh, what she's showing here. So she's, so it's not just that she's showing, um, you know, how the splines work, but that she's also showing, you know, how acceleration, velocity, um, you know, all of those things fit in, you know, position and how they're, and how they, how they work together. I don't know if we can show guys video or not. I don't know if we can cut to that. I'm not sure what's, um, anyway, so, uh, but it, it, it's the other thing about it is it's just eye candy. Like, you know, she, I think she writes software, um, uh, to, uh, she writes the software to, to visualize it. So this isn't something that's being done. Yeah. In, what, what do you think that she's using right she's here to, Unity. to go over the top? You know? I think she's using <laughs> Unity. Like, I think she's using, she, I think she wrote this in Unity, I believe. If I, re I read some stuff that she was talking about. And so, so she's not, she's not doing this, um, yeah, she's not cutting to it. I mean, she's not using After Effects or something like this. this is, as someone who's tried to, who's done a lot of this stuff in After Effects, um, the uh, uh, this is this is not done in After Effects. <laughs> this is done in. I think she's a game programmer, and so if you scrub scrub through it a little bit, guy, now that it's on air, now it's on the screen. Um, the uh, um, the it, it's a pretty. You just go through and jump to different parts. It's just you'll just see her. Just everything is visual, and this is the state of the art of showing data. And showing how things work, and and, I, and anybody who's building educational content, you know, just needs to watch this whole thing and take notes because if if we taught math this way, you know, every kid would know calculus by the time they were twelve. So, um, so anyway, so it's it's a really, um, it's an amazing, amazing uh, video. And for those of us who do visual graphics or visualize those things, uh, I would highly recommend. Um, you know, watching this video, just sit down with a cup of coffee and watch it. Even if you don't understand it all, just look at the beautiful graphics because they're just beautiful and you'll sink in. I, I, with her Bezier one, I've, I had to watch it a few times, you know, to, to get it. And, uh, but just an incredible talent when it comes to, to showing how this stuff works. There she is in, and I know she, we're not showing her on screen, but that it proves everything about the fact that if you're really good, nothing else matters and that's yeah. she's fabulous she's got her cat up and god yeah. bless her. Yeah, just, exactly. wow what a, what a what an impressive yeah. output incredible incredible mind to think to be able to critically think about how all these things work and just incredible taste you know like you know like of of uh you know her taste in in how the graphics look and how they all work um is just uh stunning so anyway i would highly recommend checking out that video yeah, that looks really exciting. Uh, next question, and I'm sad to leave this one. That turned out to be much more interesting than I ever imagined. Uh, Talalek Lopez Waterman from Norfolk, Virginia. He's uh, still traveling. We seem to see regular updates of USB, Thunderbolt, Wi-Fi, and other protocols. Do we think there is doing or that they are doing any work or to better the Bluetooth protocols? Is it me or does it seem way behind? Alex? Yeah, the hard part with, with all of these things is that, I mean, even though these we see these updates, they're not, they're regular, but they're still a couple of years apart. And usually like Thunderbolt is a lot easier because a smaller consortium and USB is, is got a USB consortium, which doesn't move that actually that fast. And USB is kind of turned into a, you know, train wreck because <laughs> we just can't tell what the cables are actually are. Um, Bluetooth is even harder because it has, the, the, the challenge with Bluetooth is that it's done by low level hardware. So it's created by low-level hardware and it is done in so many consumer devices that getting getting any kind of movement, there's been lots of stuff that's been updated on Bluetooth that we just don't see because, you know, changing the embedded hardware is um, not something that is is easy to, for the, the Bluetooth consortium can't tell people or the Bluetooth group can't tell people to just go upgrade, upgrade it. So there's been like longer range versions of Bluetooth, higher quality versions of Bluetooth that even Apple doesn't necessarily update to immediately. And so it, things take a long time for it when the, when you don't have enough leverage. I think that the big three things that they're working on right now are LE audio. So this is a higher quality audio for Bluetooth, high accuracy distance measurements so that they can, um, 
tell how close you are to a sign mostly so they can send you ads. You know, that's, that's pretty much what they want to use, use that for, but it also will help you find your keys. It's kind of like the ultra wide band that Apple uses for their little trackers. And then finally getting more data, you know, throughput so that you could theoretically use a VR, you know, for with Bluetooth as opposed to something else. And so those are the big things that I think that they're working on right now, but it takes so much when it's embedded hardware as opposed to something else there. And so I think that it's just, it, it's not them. <laughs> it's the entire industry. Just, it's just hard to get them to install something new because it's a new cost. And is there going to be enough, uh, is it going to add, add the value? Because adding two pennies to a, a device by the time it gets to the consumer is adding 10 or 20 cents, you know, by the time it gets amplified as it goes through the OEM chain. There you go. Next question. From David Brady, New York, New York. What is the prediction for M2 Silicon coming to bigger laptops? End of year spending is gaining steam, and I'm thinking of asking it for an M2 MacBook. Is this wise or foolish? Nigel. I have no information on this subject. This is pure speculation. Uh, others may have insight. I don't think you will see an M2 MacBook Pro this year. My guess is you won't see it until... Uh, first quarter next year. I think the only thing that might sneak out at the end of the year might be the Mac Pro, which they, they keep threatening to, but the availability will be a quarter or so later. Alex? Yeah, I would agree with Nigel. I, my guess is is that the earliest you would see it would be February and probably more like March um, that you'd see an M2 come out because it, it usually, again, uh, we've very rarely seen any um, events from Apple on, in December and January that used to use generally is kind of a slow, it appears to be a kind of a slow time for them as they kind of regear um, making those things work. I will tell you one little story about, um, about purchases at the end of the year. There was a broadcast company that we worked with that it was literally the nicest place that I worked. It was in DC, not New York, but, but it was, and they had everything they ever wanted. And I just, just for David, just to think about I was like, how did you do this? And they said, well, at the end of the year, at, at the end of every quarter, someone puts out an email from finance that says, hey, we're looking to burn up, you know, 450000 or 330000 or $100,000 of, of, of cash so that we can, you know, fit into some box that they're trying to fit into. And they kept a, a, a spreadsheet that was everything they wanted ranked in order of what they wanted. And they could literally just go down and find, like, if someone asked, if they said, we're trying to get rid of $330,000, they would just go down the spreadsheet to 330000 and just cut and paste that and send it to them. And they would send it within a minute of when the, they had an alarm that all of their alarms would go off in the room when, the, when, the, when finance asked for that. And what would happen is, is that they would... Um, Finance doesn't care. <laughs> they don't care what it is. They just want to fill the box, you know? And so they would, they get this thing back 30 seconds later that, that is what they needed. And then they filled the box and these guys got whatever they wanted. Just a little, I thought you'd find that to be fun, given. That is a standard corporate play. I used to get, um, I remember the first time it happened to me with one of my biggest clients. And uh, in, um, was it April? I can't remember when their fiscal year ended. We got this. Um, we are approving these two proposals you've got in, and would you mind billing them right now? It was about sixty five thousand dollars. Yeah, and I, went, <laughs> but, I don't have a problem with that. These, these guys just <laughs> we'll wound do them in the up. first quarter. Yep. They wound it up to a to a, like less than a minute. They would just give you this is what you could spend to get this out of your way. And, and so because they had a amazing. budget of X thousands of dollars for the year, and if they don't spend it, it's possible yeah. they will get their budget cut for yeah. the next year. So their goal was, was to spend the money it was, they had been allowed. <laughs> It's like, it's, it was amazing. It was, it's, it was an amazing space to work in. Anyway. Yeah. Thank you. I like this phone call. Let's yeah. go to the next question. Talala Lopez Waterman uh, in Norfolk, Virginia. For Mac users, what are you using to record multiple NDI or siphon feeds? Reliability is important. Guy? Yeah, you do it with uh, Memo Live or Wirecast. On Memo Live, you just hit uh, Add Output Destination, and then uh, you can choose what codec that you want to record in, and you can add multiple output destinations. So when you say and say Start with Show, and that way when you hit one button, it'll trigger all the records simultaneously. Otherwise, you have to go in there and tick each one, and remember to to fire them up at the same time. Uh, you will and with Wirecast, you'll need the Pro version. You can't do uh, ISO records with the uh, regular version. So with the Pro version, you can add the inputs and then when you add them, uh, there's a spot where you can choose your codec for uh, ProRes or whatever format that you want. And then uh, you just add each source individually, but it, uh, that add ISO will be grayed out if you don't have the Pro version. So those are two ways that I know of to uh, get ProRes records on the Mac. 
Fair enough. We've got uh, a few more questions here, but there are not a lot of hands raised, so we may not be spending too much time on them. We might have room for a question or two more, though not a lot. And I see our friend Felipe has already entered the playing field. Good to see you, Felipe. So uh, let's get through the next 10 minutes and then get to what Felipe has for us. Next question, please. Robin Cutshaw in Atlanta, Georgia asked, I'm using Dante virtual sound card on a Mac studio and connecting to speakers through an Avio module. The Mac shows no volume controls. How does one adjust volume levels in this configuration? And Alex. Yeah, you need to have something in front of it. Dante is a routing system. It's not a, it's not a processing system. So you have to have something ahead of it that's going to manage that, those things. That could be a mixer. That could be um, audio hijack. It could be, um, you know, a variety of different things. But something has to attenuate the, the volume because Dante doesn't have any tools internally to, to make that actually happen. Uh, next question. Talalek Lopez Waterman from Norfolk, Virginia. What codec does the ATEM line ISO switchers record in? Oh, Mitchell, do you know? H264. Okay, the standard uh, H264 codec, Alex. Now, the other thing to remember is if you're using uh, Blackmagic cameras, that you can you can record on those cameras and record from the switcher, and you can swap those in and out. So you could record everything. You'll get a resolve file back. Uh, an H.264, because the H.264, obviously, you're not going to be able to do a lot of color correction or anything else to it. There's not much data there. So um, so you just got to decide. If you're just capturing something that you're just going to kind of put together, you'll, you'll get an okay recording. But if you really want to do any hard work on it or make it a lot better and do a lot of correction, you're going to want to get it from the cameras. If, if you have Blackmagic cameras, and you can uh, fire those off and, and then pull it back in. So you recommend doing essentially a double system, recording into the system, but also recording on the camera? Yeah, and I mean, using I think the that if recording, the if, it just depends on the quality and where you're planning to to make that available. You know, like it's if, if it's just a basic record and corporate record or educational, like a classroom record or, or something like that. But if it yeah, really you're matters. You're capturing a seminar and it's just temporary. Yeah, it's fine. Yeah. But if, you're, if, it's, if it's something that really matters or the cameras don't match perfectly, <laughs> those kinds of things, um, then you may want to have a higher res version of it captured on, on, on the cameras. It's nice to do both so that you can have, you know, all those files, you know, available to you. And then you have that fabulous DaVinci Resolve connection to yep. be able to do all your color correction and everything uh, in post. So two, two, uh, two styles. Let's go on to the next question. Asma Gajar, Cape Town, South Africa, asked, I'm using a Maras HomeKit smart plug to power my Nanette 68 bs My manager does not think it's a good idea. Is there anything I need to be aware of if I bypass the power switches on the light units themselves? Uh, Guy Cochran. Yeah, if you take a look at um, the uh, manufacturer's page, it says works with appliances up to 15 amps, 1800 watts of power. That is massive. So compared to a 68 Bs, you that will easily handle that. So I would say you have no problem working with uh, that kind of wattage and amperage. Excellent. I love it when we get a simple answer. And yes, knowing at least the basics of power is really useful. I found that be able to, to you know, figure out the load of your equipment when you're plugging into shore power at some location to make sure you don't kick the breakers. Those are those are really useful little skills. So it's worth spending some time to pay attention to that. Next question. Douglas Carmichael asked, a user of the Sandbox, an L Ethereum based virtual world, paid 450000 for virtual land next to Snoop Dogg Snoopverse, Metaverse Home. Is this the start of a new trend or a bubble? You have the answer to that. Somebody's going to try to make a billion dollars off of it. Alex, what's your thoughts? You know, a lot of times when you see this stuff, you have, a, there's a lot of people with Ethereum and Bitcoin that made a lot, a lot of money, even with the drop, <laughs> they, they, they either mined it or bought it at a dollar or $10 or whatever. And they've got a lot of money just floating around in Ethereum and floating around in, in Bitcoin. And so they're going to definitely experiment with it. They're going to speculate and try to figure this out. So when you see these big numbers, you have people that have an enormous amount of money just floating around and they're just kind of like, oh, this would be cool. We don't see this when a someone who has billions of dollars buys a new, you know, boat for half a million dollars or, a, a, you know, a house that they're never going to really visit for, you know, two million dollars. So this becomes a thing because they're trying to promote it and they press do a press release. But this kind of money, when someone's got a lot of money, you know, this kind of money gets thrown around all the time. <laughs> you know? And so, and so it, I don't think that, you know, like they just buy lots of things they don't need. They're, they're trying to figure something out. They're speculating. And again, we don't see it in the press because it's just regular money. When it's Ethereum, suddenly it's a press release because 
sandbox is trying to raise, you know, trying to raise a, a attention and, and they're trying to build that value. Um, it's, it's unknown whether the, the virtual assets will have the same value. They could, they very much could, but it, it also, I mean, it's, it's pretty speculative and not something that I would do unless I had that money that was like, not even money to lose, but money that I don't even notice, <laughs> you know, is, is the only way I would spend that, that kind of thing. What did I see in the San Diego papers? I think yesterday, the day before in, online, uh, I think Sandra Bullock had a property not very far from here, just a little bit inland. It was a lovely property. She just sold it. I think it went for $11 million or something like that. And I think she used to use it when she came to Comic-Con. <laughs> and yeah. that was all. Yeah. <laughs> so at that point, they think about money differently than mm -hmm. the rest of us, I'm afraid. Um, next question. Bobby Rafferty in Central Florida asks, do I connect the 3.5 millimeter TRRS connector to a PC or a TRS connector? Alex. It depends. There are actually some computers that will do TRRS and that will be mic and, uh, line, mic and, mic and um, output at the same time. Generally, it is a T, it's a USB to TRS, two TRSs, one that's going to be out, one that's going to be in. So it's very unusual to have TRRS into a, a laptop, but it does... For instance, I believe the Mac actually is a TRR or is capable of a TRRS. So if you plug your wired headphone in TRRS into your Mac, it'll do both audio in and audio out. I think that's also light. Uh, oh, what's the old Toslink or something? It's it's like a four. I don't think it does Toslink oh. anymore. No, it doesn't oh, do does that. It, no, they to took that. that out years ago. Oh, yeah, that's, okay. We'd used it. It, it, it used to if you, you you could see it, but it doesn't. It, they, they took it out maybe a decade ago. Yeah, yeah maybe it's gone now. I don't do that much. Because not, none of us stuff. used it. Like I used <laughs> it. Go. So I, I, I remember plugging it in. It was amazing. It was like this yeah. super high quality audio that comes out of your Mac and, and it was super geeky. And that was the problem for Apple is that <laughs> Apple doesn't do well with super geeky. No, there you go. All right, next question. Kyle Hammond. From Chicago, Illinois, trying to get a video from an OBSPOT or Insta360 link into the ATEM via a mini PC. How would you send clean video out of the mini PC? No one's raised their hand on this one, and I'm not surprised. I, You know, it's just funny. From the early days of the cameras, we kept trying to get these little USB cameras into like the ATEM minis, and it was always a problem getting that translated. And I don't think they've managed a simple way. Alex, do you know anything different? I think that, you know, I'm not usually a big fan of OBS on the Mac, but I think that OBS would be capable of doing this where you see it going into a PC. There might be some delay. Like I wouldn't do it on the one that I'm talking as an overhead camera or something else that that, that could actually work. Um, but I think that OBS would, uh, depending on the power of the mini PC, you'd be able to see the USB coming in and then just say, go out of that HDMI. It's weird though, because with the Brio, you know, you have those two cables and you can go regular USB or you can go USB-C. Yeah. And so there must be some kind of chip available somewhere that goes in a camera that can say, use this with either. And yet there doesn't seem to be an, I think, a big infrastructure. For I think that. that the, I think the OBS bot, if you don't need control over the camera, the little converter box, I think I have it here. Hold on. Haven't had time, haven't had time to test it yet, but this is the, uh, UVC to HDMI adapter. <laughs> That's probably oh, easier okay. than the so, PC. <laughs> yeah, so maybe so there is a thing. I, I, we're going to test it next week. I've got a lot, I've got more time next week. And so we're going to, that's why it's sitting here. It's like, oh, this is on my, on my list of things to work on. The after hours is going to be very busy next year, next week. <laughs> so Good. Anyway. Excellent. Guy, you had a thought? Yeah, I just want to pull in David Brady's comment from the chat, which I believe will work uh, VLC on the PC. I mean, I'd do it with vMix, but I mean, it, it, it's an expensive solution for, uh, you know, you're tying up hardware plus software, the one you can just grab the device that Alex is talking about. I have one that's, uh, no, actually mine's mine's more expensive. I have an Atomos Connect that'll do the same thing, or Zato is the name of it, Atomos Zato Connect. Um, it'll take in... Uh, a USB camera and an HDMI camera and, and turn it into an HDMI source. And it's got a screen, but that thing's like 400 bucks. So, and it'll yeah, stream. It's, so it's worth what, looking what at if called? you need the Atomos Zato Connect. It's a little, it, it's pretty cool. I mean, you, so you could hook a USB camera into it and then you can hook in an HDMI camera into it. And then you could switch between the two and stream that to, to Facebook or uh, YouTube. It's, it's a pretty slick device and it's a nice little but, monitor. That, that, that sound you hear is my, my, my pocket catching fire. <laughs> I've got them in stock Credit cards today. going, release you, me, you release me. <laughs> All right, next question. Talalik Lopez Waterman in Norfolk, Virginia asks, are the differences in color science between sensors on cameras, aesthetic choices, or technical limitations, or both? Alex. 
Yeah, so um, a, lo a lot of it is technical limitations of the chip. They spend a lot of time on those chips and um, there are limitations of what those chips can do. Um, and then the color science is just not, I mean, it is, it is some artistic and aesthetic choices. Uh, obviously, I think that most of us think that Airy does it the best. <laughs> like they, they are the, the mixture of the chips and the color science. Um, Airy has the the most pleasing look for almost. That's why you see like eighty percent or ninety percent of films now are shot on Airy's. Um, and then, but they, but you, can, it doesn't mean that you can't correct a black magic camera to look like an Airy. But the Airy just for filmmakers, what they like is that it just comes out ready to go. <laughs> like it just comes out like, oh, that's great. So that's the um, that's the big advantage there. Mitch Hill. Yeah, an example of what Alex is just talking about is the uh, Airy LF or Super 35 compared to a Venice Sony. Mm -hmm. uh, the Sony probably has better specs, but it doesn't have better color science. So the yeah. decision ultimately comes to, uh, to color in my book. Okay, we'll just knock out this last question and then move on to our guest. Stefan Fischer from Würzburg, Germany, asking, does the origin where products are manufactured, China, USA, Germany, matter to you when you make purchase decisions? Alex. Only with T-shirts. Turns out that the, that the, um, the Eddie Bauer shirts made in, uh, in <laughs> Vietnam actually have better cloth than the ones that are made in Thailand. And I don't know why. And, and you know, like it's, so I actually look at the, the, the things, but that's the only place I pay attention because I don't, I don't know. That factory is getting better, better fabric. So anyway. For me, sometimes if data is running for it, through it and it mm. has the potentially to grab it, I'm a little leery, but generally I don't care. Uh, let's, it's time. Our friend Felipe Bias is here joining us from, I believe, still the Czech Republic, who's a, a dear old friend who's been around this business and had been here in office hours for a long time, is going to help us today. We're really excited to have you here, Felipe. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me here again. And I'm coming for the first time on office hours from my new apartment and my new office. <laughs> oh, nice. Nice, nice. Did you, did, was it a big move or a small distance move uh, it was a uh, it was a small distance but it was a big move i mean it, it, moving is never pleasant right <laughs> okay here's the big question are you gaining boxes or losing boxes at this stage in your life i gained boxes no, i now figured I, as I much have, i have multiple sofas because there is a sofa in my office there's a sofa in, on anna's office there's a sofa in our living room <laughs> So, there you go. It's Welcome terrible to life now. Progress. Listen, we're really excited to have you here. If, if uh, I think it was huge news when Da Vinci and uh, Resolve came out with their mobile app and said we actually are going to be allowing uh, serious nonlinear editing on a mobile platform. Everybody's been talking about it, so I'm just going to throw it to you to give us a little bit of a of a brief about what their goals were and what you've seen in the early part of this. Well, first of all, I would like to even thank Blackmagic to have added me on their beta. And they are encouraging people to just share whatever they're seeing. So yes, it still crashes because it's a beta. Uh, things are evolving. There, There is a new build every day. But the, the, the first and biggest point that I can make about DaVinci on the iPad is that is not a mobile version of DaVinci, is actually DaVinci there. So uh, it's the same code. To, uh, I cannot confirm the code itself. I can confirm the functionality, the, 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 what is available on the application. So between okay. the cut page and the color page, really, there is a lot of things that are there. And for example, for the cut page, I was looking into the training from Ripple Training and I couldn't find anything that was not on the iPad from the cut page. So would you say that if you're familiar with the cut page in DaVinci Resolve as a full app, you will be instantly familiar with it on the mobile app? Y yes, and it supports the speed editor. So you can connect the speed editor via Bluetooth to the iPad and, and add it that way. Nice. Okay, well, that you know, a lot of cases we don't see that kind of one-to-one -one parity. So that's excellent. Anything else that was, stands out for you? Well, uh, it runs on iPads with the M series chip, right? So the M1, the M2, it runs on the 2018 iPad Pro. So a lot of people are going to be happy about that. Now, it doesn't support every effect or feature on the 2018 because of memory limitations, but it's there. You're, you're able to do, to do a few things. And I've been testing only with 8K HEVC footage from the Sony A1 and 
it, it, it goes really well with the M series. The 2018 is a little bit more difficult. You need to work in proxy mode. It has proxy mode on DaVinci. You, do, you, you cannot transcode on it to proxies or, or not easily the way you can do on the, on the desktop version. But if you transcode them in advance, you can relink the, the proxies. Nice, nice. Alex, you had a question. Yeah, I, I, I tried it on the 2018. I happened to, when it came out in beta, I had a 2018 with me because it's what I use with my BLK360. And so I didn't have the other one. So I'm now going to put it on an M1. I don't have the M2 yet. Do you, you're using it on the M2 right now? I'm using on an M1. Mm -hmm. uh, I can see where memory is a limitation. For example, if I try to open a project that's too big, for example, I have a documentary here. Yeah. That documentary simply doesn't open. Right. Uh, in theory, the project itself would open, but I think as soon as it gets to to the limit of the memory, it just crashes the application, and then you yeah. can't open it. Yeah, and I'm. This is the first app that I've seen that I went, oh, maybe I need to get an M2 because when when the new M2 came out, the iPad, I was like, eh, mine's pretty fast. I don't know anything that I feel like is going that sluggish. And when I saw this, I was like, oh, you know. And honestly, yeah. Also, the first application that I have ever seen that uses. CPU, GPU, yeah. and media engines to its maximum. Yeah. It's using everything. Yeah, and and I think that um, so I'm I'm really excited about it. the The interesting thing is what they picked. You know, the edit page and or the the, the fast what was it the um cut the cut, the cut page yeah. and the and the color page. The interesting thing about that is that means that a, a DP can sit on a set and cut together a scene throw the color nodes that they expect to be used. You know, this is how, this was the, my artistic intention, you know, on the iPad and then send it out rather than then someone saying, well, we didn't know what you wanted. They're going to be like, no, this is what I wanted. <laughs> you know, so I thought that the, that their choices, at first I was like, why didn't they put all the other, and no, the other stuff is a lot more complicated. Um, but 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 the, this is a, a great set tool. And the fact that the iPad is so accurate for color you know, and able to view HDR, you know, the, you know, I think because outside of a cal calibrated monitor, the iPad is the, the closest thing to the real thing that you can get. Um, it's a, at first I was like, I don't know why they would try to shoehorn this, all this into an iPad. But as soon as my mind, as soon as I tried, I opened it up and played with it for like 10 minutes and was like, oh, I get it. <laughs> like, well, like this, everyone's going to use this on a set. A colorist that I follow had a very good point. Uh, iPad OS is color managed a hundred percent, so you don't have the the same problems right. that you might have on a PC or even on a Mac when it comes to color management. So yep. that's a huge advantage, right? Because on on DaVinci you can go and say, "Hey, I want to do the DaVinci color management. My footage is coming in SDR, and I want to spit it out in HDR." And boom, there it is. Yeah. You you have a great start, and your iPad will show you that. Yeah, absolutely. It's really that's, really cool. That's a, that's pretty amazing. Um, what do you think? What not, there are a lot of positives already. Have you seen things that you're a little concerned about as you're going forward? Is there things that it doesn't do as well as you would hope for? Um, uh, yes, there is one feature that I would love to see on the DaVinci for iPad is a way to force rendering to a cache. So for example, right now, if I use Fusion titles, uh, a lot of them are not going to play back real time. I would love to be able to render them uh, to a specific storage that I can choose. So it plays back like as a ProRes, for example, like we have on, on Final Cut. That would be a good feature. Right now, that's not possible. Same thing for applying a lot of nodes on, 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 on a clip and effects at some point. The M1, for example, is going to say, hey, I'm done. Remember, the M1 on the iPad is a great chip, but the M1 on itself is the same thing that we have on a Mac Mini. And then if we are asking a Mac Mini to do a lot of nodes of color grading on an 8K footage and play back real time, this is going to be a little hard. But it, would it be fair to say that as the chips continue to evolve, this might be less and less of a problem as we go forward? Oh, absolutely. So absolutely. It's, it's something here in the early forms. Black Magic just sold for Apple the next two or three generations of iPad because the next two or three, like M2, M3, or whatever that comes after, always going to be, yes, and DaVinci is going to be even faster, and you're going to be able to apply even more nodes and be able to play uh, real-time even more Fusion titles. Uh, and I, I feel like I feel like this is the first time we've seen in a long time 
um, someone really pressing down on the on the the, the hardware. You know, the, we always feel like app, the iPads are overpowered for almost everything that they're running into. Um, and, and this is where the, the Resolve is just going to keep pressing down on it, you know, as, yeah. they, as they keep and going forward. Finally, you're they, up at the top end. And, and, and they just, they're starting to justify, hey, maybe a bigger iPad, a 15-inch iPad. Ooh, and they're starting inch. to justify, they're going to push now Apple, for 36. example, to, <laughs> if, <laughs> if Apple were not... If Apple were not working already on a version of their Pro apps for the iPad, oh, for sure they are now. Because this thing is, 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 is amazing. And the other thing is to keep in mind is this is not only Blackmagic there doing work, right? Blackmagic needs to have worked with Apple to get their expertise to run this thing as, as well as it can. Uh, and <laughs> well, it got a little ahead of them both companies. <laughs> got a little ahead of them because Apple put it in the in the keynote. Like they were Apple was showing the, the <laughs> Apple was showing Resolve in the keynote, and all of us were like, "Where did that come from?" You know, like you know, it's like, <laughs> where's the press release? <laughs> and there, there was no press release. There's no, no one talked about it. And I and I, I thought, well, Resolve might have fell, fallen a little behind. And Apple uh, was like, "Well, we already did the video, so." <laughs> so there we go. And, the, and the, a couple of other things here that are very interesting. For example, if you don't mind, I can I can yeah, show, show that. Yeah, go uh, for it. Yeah. Yeah. Love me. Uh, yeah. When we go here to the Projects Manager screen, we have the same options as we have on DaVinci on, on a computer. We have local database, we have network database in case you use it, and we have their cloud collaboration tools. So here it is, me, I have uh, a document. Hey, Felipe, here. is your connectivity through USB-C for this demo? Is that what you're doing? So this is all it IO is. through USB-C. Mm -hmm. Okay, just want to know yes. how so you're getting I have in yeah, so I have a hub that's going to an ATAM and is getting network through that hub as well. Um, and I was thinking here that I could just create so this gets, a project. This, to, to kind of explain this too, this, this gets back into what we were just talking about is that because you have a cloud, you could have a DP putting stuff up, putting their color, whatever on it, and sending it out, and then the editor gets that, they're able to open it, just open that file, and they could theoretically even be working on it at the same time. They could be... Uh, and I know that's going to be very small, but on this Croatia 2022 uh, project here, there is on the top right two uh, an icon of two little guys. That means that this project is enabled for multi-user. So I can open on this iPad at the same time as someone else opens on a computer. I could be working on the cut page while someone else is working on the color page. Uh, so this is where already... So it's not full multi-user, but it allows two, two, two people to work on the same files in two different aspects of the software. Is that what Correct. I'm understanding? That's, okay. how, that, that, that's how Blackmagic describes collaboration is you're not going to have two editors editing at the same time, but okay. you're going to have an editor and a sound person but, and a caller oh, person. And one of the one of the features that Davici has on the caller page is that you can do remote grades. What that means is that you can be grading clips independently if they are being used or not on an edit. That means that by the time that the editor says, hey, my edit is ready to, for a color pass, the colorist can have done already the color of all clips and they apply that remote grade on the timeline and voila, now they need, just need to finesse. Okay. Yeah, and you could, I mean, again, to go back to what we were just talking about on the set, I mean, this is the holy grail of being able to be pushing this stuff, uploading it theoretically and dropping it in there, having an editor cut it in real time while you're still, cut that scene while you're still shooting it, having people play with the color, having people like, you know, look at those things, having a, a, a producer somewhere else, you know, watching the finished product and being able to make change, make, make suggestions, like they might get to... Um, you know, they're at two o'clock in the afternoon, they're about to break down a setup and they go, hey, you know, could you just get a close up of the hands doing this thing? That would really help the edit. And that would really, you know, and, and those kinds of things can be all kind of integrated into a unified experience. Yeah. And, and if you're shooting on a camera that does proxies in camera, for example, my Sony A1 does proxies in camera, you don't even need to deal with the original media. You can just ingest the proxies right. and work from that, for example. Uh, a couple of things that I just want to show here. So this is the cut page. Basically, the cut page is meant for a speed editing, not something amazing that you're going to pull together, generally a string out. Um, we can create bins, we can import media from external SSDs, from internal storage. Uh, we can, this sync um, 
feature here is basically the equivalent to multicam. So you can do multicam on DaVinci Resolve here. You have transitions. It comes with, with a good amount of transitions for video, uh, a few for audio, right? Just some crossfades, uh, titles. There are several fusion titles that come built in here. Uh, someone might have the question, can you install plugins? No, you can't at the moment. This, I would imagine that's even a limitation with Apple. You can't install audio units at the moment, not that I'm aware of. I think wow. that was a I thing in the past. I didn't expect to be available and you know, coming out of the gate. So these are all, all those, wow. This is ridiculous. There is Sky replacement here. Uh, everything that I looked for, it was here. It, it's a good amount of, uh, of effects. Um, you know, what else here? And there is our audio effects. And we have a few generators as well. Um, and let me open here a My Croatia 2022 project. I, I, I just put together for like just 10 minutes, a couple of clips together just to show different features that DaVinci has on the cut page and on the color page, just to, to give a little taster here. Uh, so first of all, up here, I have my option to play from proxies. So all of my media have proxies. I could play from the camera originals, and uh, but these are 8K HEVC from the Sony A1, so it might not play that well. So let me hit play here. Videos when I'm already on the passenger seat after like four hours in a country away to, to make... Okay, so this is just the uh, original media, plays no problem most of the time, uh, but I'm gonna go for my proxies. In the beginning here, I have just a title from Fusion. I have a more complex title underneath it, uh, and the reason why I'm using the simple one is because the, the, more the more complex one doesn't play real time. So you see, this is one of the things that I would love to have, a way to render this in advance. I only... Um, and on the clip itself, there are some speed preferences that you can do here. You can affect your transform, you can crop, you can do an instant zoom that basically would... Um, the instant zoom is actually this other button here that it's basically... kind of like Ken Burns, right? It's just a, a yeah, quick little... There is, yeah, there is the dynamic zoom that was the next icon and there is the, the this other one that I clicked that basically duplicates your clip for five seconds on the track above and it does a 200, uh, 200 zoom basically oh. uh, on it. So just a quick way that you can just zoom in and out, right? Like the way people do on YouTube. Dynamic zoom. We have auto color in the end here. If you notice, this video already has some color in it. And the way we can see that is in the bottom here of the film strip, there is effects and a few other icons. There's a bunch of things happening already on this clip. One of them being voice isolation. Hear the original sound of this recording. Only remember to make videos when I'm already on the passenger seat after like four hours in a country away to... That's basically a car. <laughs> and look at what voice isolation is doing right on the spot. Videos when I'm already on the passenger seat after like four hours in a country away to... Just a toggle and, and a setting for how strong you want it. I had this in 60, and 60 is pretty good. 60, we don't hear the car almost. I only remember to make videos when I'm already on the passenger seat. After yeah, like switch it off. Four hours in a country away to, to make videos. But right now... <laughs> yeah, it's pretty good, right? <laughs> um, what else can we show on this clip here? Uh, not, not much more. I, I, I mean, are, are there any questions that we should take a look at? Yeah, we're now. starting to get questions in. Mitch, do you want to toss us into our first question? Sure. First one in from Sky Gleason in Seattle, Washington. And here on our panel, how's the media and storage connected to the iPad? Okay. You can connect directly an SSD to it, to the Thunderbolt port. You can connect via uh, a USB hub, which was what I was doing earlier today. Uh, but the thing is, I, I didn't have a cable fast enough that was USB A to C for my SSD. So then I decided to do internal storage for for office hours here. So I'm running from the internal storage. Okay, so it's just like any other system. If you can keep it local, uh, that is the fastest I/O, 
and then everything else gives you a little bit. Have you seen any um, any significant differences between USB C and and running direct no. Thunderbolt? No. When I when I have this SSD connected directly with the with a Thunderbolt cable, uh, let me just back to my camera. So this SanDisk, uh, you know that. Oh, it's not going to want to focus right now, of course. But the SanDisk Extreme Pro, uh, that's what I use for, for editing in general. Anything that uh, the iPad can read, APFS, H HFS, and um, avoid XFAT uh, on the iPad. Doesn't, doesn't, you don't have a lot of, of performance out of that. But APFS works well. But beyond uh, that, you're not really seeing any limitations in the size no. of projects you can do because you can attach external storage. storage right, the it. size of project, yeah. If you have too, too much media in that project, it's not going to open. I can tell you that. I have this documentary here, this VGH. This is a documentary with not as much footage as Q was, but this one doesn't open because it's a fairly big project. And, and do you have and, a lot of memory think, in that iPad? Is that iPad I don't know out? what's the number. This is a one terabyte iPad. So this is the iPad so, M1 that has the biggest amount of RAM and still is not as much as you would want to have. So then, if you're gonna if you're serious about getting into this, you need to max out your equipment, get the get the M2 and get the biggest drive you can. Is that is that what you think? Uh, that would be my opinion if this will be an important tool on your work life so for example like alex mentioned if you if you're the guy on set that that that's doing the it or or you're doing or you did dop and you also want to have a say on things it it's an interesting thing to have in your hand uh, but not something yeah. to cheap out on in terms of specs or capabilities you're right <laughs> at the leading edge of uh, but running out of room. And to put it in perspective, you know, to, to deck a, out an iPad, uh, M, I'm just looking at it, not that I'm going to buy one immediately. Um, <laughs> it's but, a MacBook. Uh, <laughs> but to, to do an, an iPad Pro and deck it out with the two terabytes and, you know, everything else without cellular, just Wi-Fi, you're still looking at 2548 from the App Store, uh, from the Apple Store. And um, and that was only $500 less than my Mac. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so I mean, <laughs> Apple ha no. Apple is very funny, right? Because you get mm. the cheapest uh, the, the cheapest device, and then you go to the next one. They overlap this amount in terms of features, and the next right. one overlaps also that amount. So it's really difficult for you to to choose where you want. Um, the iPad is a great portable device, right? I mean, you once once it's not in the keyboard stand. Uh, so this, this, by the way, this is the 2018 11 inches that also runs um, Da Vinci on it. The, the one that Alex had. I mean, is this important? Dealing with your your fingers on the screen and 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 the Apple Pencil. If that's important for you, maybe that iPad, that expensive one, would be a good one. But you can I'm also get to. I have an M1, SSD. and you're finding that for the most part, the M1 works for for most of what you're doing. For the most part, and again, I'm saying here, this 8K footage that is, here, of course, not black one. magic. Oh, it, it, uh, okay, so what it supports, which is important for us to know here, uh, it supports H.264, it supports H.265, it supports ProRes, and it supports black magic RAW. No ProRes RAW. Uh, <laughs> So, uh, there's a, I, I'm interested. This is a whole they're really problem. good I'm friends really in some in, departments and I'm, not very good friends in well, other departments. I'm, under, I'm curious what happened with Apple ProRes RAW, given that DJI, DJI um, said, hey, we're not going to support ProRes RAW, RAW after March or something of next year. And Blackmagic doesn't support it. And oh, really? I was like, something went, something happened. Like, I'm very curious what happened there. I don't have oh, any I didn't know about it. I didn't DG, know about DJI. DJI. Is, is, there's a big thing because I'm looking at getting the Mavic that has the, um, and there's a big thing on it that says after February, March, they're not supporting Apple ProRes raw anymore. And so I'm just curious what. It's what just a weird world yeah. out there. I, yeah. No one can anyway. figure this out and we never will. But yeah, anyway. with the support for those codecs, uh, yeah. knowing that you can play back 8K on these devices, if you will be playing 8K on, the, on these devices, it, it, it is. If you're playing back 8K anyway, you're not. You are not getting the the lowest end device any case, right? right? Yeah, I'm absolutely. Gonna... And this is a niche that for people who need to do this, they need to do this. This is a workflow that they want to investigate, and it's brand new. Never been able to do this before, so you're in the 
I, I'm, I'm now, I've gone into like next week, I'm going to shoot 8K, 120 on a 12K, you know, on the 12, on the, on the black magic 12K. And let's, let's see how it plays back. I would, I, I would think there would be some drop frames involved in that, Alex. <laughs> I am very curious. I want to see, well, I want to see, so, I want to hear yeah. about it. How, yeah. how power hungry is, is the, the software? With yeah, the, battery battery power hungry. the battery losing? Yeah, that, because yeah, if you're plugging, hungry. if you're, yeah, if you're already plugging that hole with a hard drive, how do you, how do you then power it? Do you daisy so chain? I, I did a very simple edit the other day. Uh, I got the iPad with between 80 to 90% battery. I opened DaVinci and I had a timeline that was about two and a half hours long in which I used um, a speed ramp to make that seven minutes long. It was a time lapse basically in 8K HDR. Um, it probably took me about an hour, an hour and a half to edit that. And by the time that I was hitting export, I had 10% battery. Wow. So, are there USB dongles like, or USB-C dongles like there are lightning dongles that'll allow you to power and do IO at the same time? Or is that not Yes, the one I'm using here right now. Uh, okay. I have a hyperdrive 9 in one, basically. Okay. So you can you can work around it if you put a dongle on oh, and then apply, attach power. You can work for a and remember time. you can also plug in the iPad to an LG monitor or to a studio display, and they're all going to power and they're going to be able to connect to other devices through them as well. Okay, well, it did or something like that. Won't need shore power. You could get some of those big batteries and just power it simultaneously with working on it. And that will help. So good. Well, that's not a stop. Don't forget as well that if you have the Apple keyboard, that you have the USB C at the bottom for your I/O, but then you also have right. power here on the keyboard, so that you can edit good for point, an extended guy. period of time. Yeah. Okay, so if you're really looking at working dit kind of stuff, there there are ways to get around this and make it work. And a, a Thunderbolt for dock Apple. would also accomplish that for you. Right. Now what, Mitch? Oh, Thunderbolt okay. dock would accomplish that for you also. Oh, that's true. Yeah. All and right. a good point here for Apple to add more ports, right, to the iPad. Maybe a second <laughs> Thunderbolt. <laughs> they they hate putting ports. They don't exactly. like drilling holes in the case. <laughs> they want them sealed. Uh, let's move on to the next question. And it's from Josh Kaufman in Pittsburgh, PA. Do we know what the release price will be? Are the features of Resolve for iPad beta commensurate with the free or the studio versions? Good question. So, Nobody has raised a hand. Uh, do you I know? Yeah, I received that communication at some point. Again, this can change between now and the release, but at the moment, the information that I had is DaVinci Resolve 18 will be for free, and there will be an in-app purchase to go to studio, and that's going to be below $100. Okay. Now you know what you're facing. And again, for a DIT working uh Commercially with this stuff, that's pretty negligible. So that means that if you're using, if you're working with up to 4K media, uh, you can be running this for free, just the normal version. Yeah. Both and I just realized and I was using. IPad. I just realized I was using a term without thinking there may be people listening. That's a digital intermediate technician who's ten, uh, normally the person on set responsible for this kind of I.O. And, and paying attention to how data gets m stored and moved around a set. So somebody who's professionally working there, and it, it, you're right, it may be the, the director of photography or somebody else who is involved in this, but there's, what, there are ways to do these things. Uh, let's hit the next question. Oh, Sky has a thought. Sky? Just, I sat behind the original DaVinci here in Seattle, and uh, when it was a half a million dollar piece of hardware and software, very specialized tool just in color and so to watch this come out on this platform for that price point it's my mind is still reeling here it's pretty a pretty astonishing the amount of capability that somebody with a semi-modest budget i mean you can't do this dirt cheap obviously but for the kinds of things i used to laugh and say for the catering budget of most of my shoots you can now get a full-blown rig and um it's it's a an extraordinary area era that we're living through. Um, let's hit the next question. And it's from Sky Gleason, Seattle, Washington, and right here on our panel. Does this iPad version have all the same modules as the desktop version or just editorial? It only has at the moment the cut page and the color page. The cut page, it seems to be very feature um, 
<laughs> identical <laughs> to the desktop version, the color page is very close to everything that's on the desktop page. From what I'm reading, they don't want to stop on cut and color. They will be adding more things. That's insane. <laughs> that's insane that this is an iPad application. <laughs> Do you think it'll happen the same way? I mean, what, what we've seen is that from the full DaVinci Resolve, I remember before it had the cut page and people were a little confused when it came out. What is this cut page thing? What is this color page thing? Do you think they, they will go into a sound page and or a um, motion graphics page or something like that and then include those in this kind of app as opposed to working on taking the whole monolithic Resolve and packetizing it down for an iPad? Based on what DaVinci is right now on the iPad, I would say that they're going to bring the whole DaVinci here. Okay. Uh, so you the only that things it... that they changed is where some UI elements are and how they look and their sizes. But other than that, it really is DaVinci and I, running I think here. The, I think the challenge with a lot of the other pages as opposed to the cut page and the color pages. There's lots of little things that you have to do, lots of little interface things that you have to work through. So I'm sure that, that, that these are relatively easy to say, okay, I'm just going to give you these things. Um, and then, but they just have to figure the other things out. I actually think that the fusion page is probably the e the next easiest one to, um, to add over. Still the, nodes. Yeah. Yeah. The node, you know, still. So I think that that would probably, I'd be then I'd be really fascinated. I think it would be really interesting to see audio editing here. I think it'd be really hard, you know, to to do audio like fine fine tuned audio editing on an iPad. But they just, it just had to rethink the interface a little bit. To do it like you do it in the desktop would be difficult. And I think that's the same problem with the edit page. So it'll be really interesting to see what they do. Interesting. Right. This whole thing is just fascinating. Um, let's hit the next question. From Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, PA. I hear LumaFusion also has M1 Apple silicon optimizations. Can you compare and contrast the way that both apps have leveraged the new Apple silicon for iPad? Let's start with Alex. Well, Alex. Uh, no, I'm sorry. Let's go Felipe. Uh, Felipe, first. Yeah. Felipe first. Sorry about that. No, I was just going to say that LumaFusion really is an excellent application. It was not the first of a kind, but you could see an NLE being born from scratch using all the APIs and frameworks that were available for iPadOS, and they used it really well. But you saw also the growing pain of starting an NLE from scratch, meaning uh, just very recently that we got scopes into the application and so on and so forth. Uh, and multicam, I don't think it still is a thing on LumaFusion is yet to come. Uh, so I think DaVinci is bringing competition here. And I think uh, it's going to be hard for LumaFusion, but also it's just showing there is a space. Fair enough. And Alex had a thought. Yeah, I think that LumaFusion is going to have its own space. I think there's a lot of people that where Resolve is going to be a lot heavier than what they want to do. You know, it's just a lot more complicated and it's also more expensive than, than LumaFusion. And it is, and LumaFusion has got still a lot of creature comforts for the average editor who is not necessarily trying to do a Resolve level, level thing. Now, what I will say is that Resolve is a huge benefit for, for those of us who use the Resolve on the desktop. You know, like, so it's a huge thing for, for Resolve folks to use it on the iPad. And I do think that there'll be some people that are a little bit more technically minded who want to play with the color at that level that will go towards uh, Resolve. But I, ha I thought about this a lot when I started playing with it because at first I thought, oh no, LumaFusion's in big trouble. And they're friends of ours. <laughs> so we want I was like a little worried. But I actually think that they live in two pretty different worlds as far as the user base. Um, there's some of us that cross over both of them. I think you could have both of them on the iPad and be be pretty happy with I might because I for instance I switch back and forth between Final Cut and Resolve uh, almost every week. You know I have a certain kinds of projects that I do in Resolve and certain kind of projects I do in Final Cut, and so um, I could see myself switching back and forth between LumaFusion and and Resolve. Um, now I I think what gets really complicated is if Final Cut ends up dropping to the iPad, then it becomes comp you know then that that's more problematic I think than than Resolve for for um for them. Sky, your thoughts? Well. I've always thought nonlinear editing is like a language. And so NLEs, the the Avid used to be the tool because that was so embedded in, in early days of, of nonlinear editing. But now that, uh, again, I, I love LumaFusion for what it does. It's a, it has great tools. And it also has people that speak that language now and only speak that language. So that's why I immediately thought to have 
the ability to understand this language on this new device. Uh, I'm kind of looking forward to that 36 inch iPad. I think that's going to be a lot of fun. <laughs> Just uh, don't try to find a Scotty vest that'll hold it. Um, let's go to the next question. Next question in from Tony Mobley in Newton, Georgia. Is it iPad Pro only or any M series? Oh, that's a good question. I only tested on the iPad Pro M1 and the iPad Pro 2018. Uh, I don't know because I don't have access to the other one that is M series. But I, it, the other the other comments that I read is that any iPad that's on iOS 16, but then. Well, the, yes, the M2 confirmed. boosted it's, a lot of capability, so I'm wondering if it's. It, I wonder how much you jump when you can move from it, the. It, it, it's iPad only, so it, it's not available for the um, for the desktops. Oh, you okay. Yeah, it's it's. I can. I'm just looking at. <laughs> looking at the that back makes end. sense. So you started so talking it's, M chips. I went, huh? No, but, it won't. Yeah. It won't work on the on the studios or the Mac Minis. It'll only work on the iPad. Okay, okay that makes sense. Um, let's move on to the next question. From Josh Kaufman and Pittsburgh, PA, are there any optimizations for the Apple Pencil in the user inter interface or perhaps accommodations? Well, for the M2, you have that hover option from, from the Apple Pencil that I think is going to be very handy to, for example, uh, let me change back here to the iPad. Uh, if I have my trackpad and I hover over the clip, I can see my tool change. And it's, it's, I know that's going to be a little small for you to see there, but just hovering over the edit point here, I can so see. So, how far my is the tip changing. of your pencil over the actual surface of the iPad to get that change to take place? Uh, if I don't have the M2, but from the reviews I was seeing, it was about a, a pinky distance. So, so up to maybe a third of an inch, like half an, of an inch. Yeah, depending on how fat your hands that. are. And and one of the th one of the things that we haven't seen yet is um, that Apple hasn't talked about, and I don't know if they will, but but a lot of times with other touch pads that we've used, where you can um, get a little bit of distance from the, it's used for airbrushing as well. So you can sit there and have a soft brush and 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 go, oh, I want to, you know, so you can airbrush, um, you know, paint effects, which you couldn't do right now with with Resolve, but you could imagine with Fusion or with other things, you could th theoretically have an incredible amount of control. Yeah, so instead of you pressure, you get distance to determine the flow. That'd be amazing. And for folks who are used to airbrushing things, it's it's just a, it's a more natural, natural feel for them because they've they've that's how they've worked. That makes perfect sense. Uh, we still have about four questions left, but if anybody's interested in tossing any more, we've got about 20 minutes more to go. And, and I definitely want to show you the color page, so... Oh, yeah. Let's if we haven't done that, do you want to let's do that it. now. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Felipe, okay. take it away. So let's take a look at the color page. Uh, <laughs> there are so many things here that I want to show you. First of all, we do have that button that ignores everything that has been done to a clip and just shows you the clip itself, right? So in case you're, you're having to play back in real time and uh, not be affected, you normally would do, use that on the cut page. But you can switch on and off that. Um, I can create as many nodes as I want. If it's going to play back real time, it's a different story. Now, let me take a look at this clip here, for example. Uh, if we look at my timeline of clips here, this one, this one, and this one, and this one, they all were shot around the same time with the cameras with the same settings. So one of the things that you can do on, on DaVinci Resolve is to group all of these images. And I have grouped all of them. So when you can see here this little chain, the green chain above them, that means that they are grouped. And when they're grouped, that means that you can grade all of them at the same time. For example, do a master grade. And then on the clip level, you can go and adjust things um, slowly. So for example, in this clip right now, these are the grades that were, that I was doing before I grouped everything. So before I grouped everything, it would have looked like this. Let me just switch off these ones. Okay, there is a few extra here that are switched on. And there, oh. Almost updated. And okay, doesn't want to show. Let me do this. I'm gonna I'm gonna blow all of this away. 
going to blow this and I'm going to get my group grades. There it is. Now we are back into the original. So up here I have a pre a group pre clip. Uh, I do, I'm not a colorist, so I don't know exactly how to use all of them. I know how to use the clip and the group post clip. The clip is an adjustment just for that clip and the group post clip is adjustment for the whole group. So for example, I'm going to add here a node. I'm going to add actually five nodes. One of them I can label and I can call this the LUT. So it comes with several LUTs here, um, mainly the, the conversions from log to Rec. 709 from all of these cameras. And I have the one here for my camera. And the there are, there are several different ones here that I could choose, but I like the last one. It, it starts in a good place for me to create this. Um, then I can name the second one contrast, for example. And within the wheels here, we have all of them. We have the log wheels, we have our normal color wheels, we have the HDR color wheels, we have curves, we have color warper, we have our qualifier, power windows, we have tracker, uh, and a bunch of other things that I don't even know how to use. And of course, the camera settings here in case you're going to be using um, Blackmagic RAW. But going back to my wheels, what I would do here, for example, is I would just increase a little bit the contrast on this image. And again, I'm doing this to the whole group. So if I jump to this other image here, this is being affected as well. If I switch it off, we can see the grade that is being applied from the other one that I'm grading right now. And we can see that they are fairly different, right? So not necessarily I'm going to use all of that grade. Um, I'm just going to play a little bit here. I'm going to create the next one, making a saturation node. So I'm going to only play with saturation on this one. I like to saturate my images quite a bit, but then in the end, I need to fix the skin. So I create another node for skin. And in this one, I can use the qualifier, come here to her back, take a look at what I've selected. And now just start adding more to this image. And here I would need to make sure that I'm selecting only what I want to change. And this is a meticulous work that you're going to be going back and forth between the what part of saturation you're affecting, what part of uh, luminance you're affecting, and what part of chrominance you're affecting. But right now I have more or less her skin selected. Now I can go to my wheels and say, hey, get this saturation and knock it down a little bit. And when we remove this mask, we can see here what we've done on zoom. We're on zoom through an ATEM. You're not going to see exactly what I'm seeing. So it might be a little bit more nuclear for you than it is for me, but it made a difference. So if I switch off each node one by one, we can see here what we're doing. So we can start doing a very complex grade. Um, and of course, like I was mentioning, I'm also affecting this last one. So this last one is not looking as good as I would like. So then I can actually go to the adjustments just for this clip that are not going to affect the other ones. And I can start offsetting a couple of things here. For example, I can come and bring my shadows down again and I can get my highlights a little bit back because I still have quite a bit of them there um, and bring up my mids and I'm going to add another node for saturation. I don't need it that saturated. There you go. So this is just to have an idea of the stuff that I have and I have waveforms and I have a parade, and I have a vector scope, and I have a histogram, and I have this other one that uh, basically I never used before. Uh, and this is all doing SDR, right? If I were to do HDR, I also have my waveform set for HDR here that I could be using. So there's a lot of things. And uh, I wanna show you one effect that is here, pretty powerful, let me just, change this back here to 10 bit. Um, I'm going to add another node. And in this node, I'm going to bring an effect and I'm going to look for depth map. 
So this is a different way that I can affect parts of the image without needing to select a color, for example. In this case here, I want to change her exposure without affecting the rest of the image. So I can use the depth map to basically select what is in focus in this case. And it's here. generating the, the depth map? It is generating the depth map live. So I have two options here, right? The quality faster or better. For fa I, I use faster so I can uh, do these changes here very quickly. So whatever is black is not being affected and whatever is white is what will be affected. So I can play with this here with Cam as well. And now I basically have her selected. And after I have her selected, I'm going to keep it on faster just so we can do this uh, more real time. I can affect her. Now her contrast, there it is, her bikini going a little bit darker, bringing mid-tones up, bringing back the bikini down, and a little bit more highlight. So here it is what I've done on that just affected her without using any mask. So this depth map is absolutely great for these type of things. And Felipe, just doing, can you uh, add a garbage mat to that too if you needed it in, on top you of You can, the you can. You could, you could use, for example, here your, um, your power, power windows and uh, select however it is that you want. Let me do a different one. Let me do a circle one. And let's say I want to affect around where her face is. This is just to, to, to give you an idea. And I can tell it to track. And it's going to track all of that. And then on the later iPad. on, once you're finished that, <laughs> on, on the, the iPad, iPad. <laughs> uh, uh, and an 8K. Oh, no, sorry. This one is 4K. This is 4K, uh, 120 frames a second. Yeah. So this is... It's a lot of things here that you can do. It's great. <laughs> Any questions? Probably. Let's go to the next one. We have other people who are waiting in line here. Let's uh, dive in, Mitch. Tony Mobley, New to Georgia, asking, didn't see it in the App Store. Is it still just beta? It is still a closed beta. Uh, I know that they are added, adding more and more people, uh, probably people that they already have some relationship with. Uh, but it's difficult to imagine that's not going to be released soon because it's pretty, getting pretty there. Stable. Yeah. You feel like it's getting close. All right, next yeah. question. Lalek Lopez, Waterman from Norfolk, Virginia. How did we get on the beta program? I would say that if you have a contact at Blackmagic, that's the one of the ways to get on the beta. Otherwise, it's not a public beta. So I... Yeah, I, I, I was invited. I didn't even ask for it. Oh, there you go. So it's important to, to make these kind of contacts. This is why we spend all this time online and at trade shows and things like that, getting to know people. Next question. Josh Kaufman from Pittsburgh, PA. What is the greatest challenge to performance on Resolve Mobile? What processes, as for clips, is the greatest challenge resolution, frame rate, or number of concurrent tracks in the timeline? And nobody raised a hand on this. Uh, do you have any particular thoughts, Felipe? Yeah, all of the above. Yes. Uh, it's going to be a uh, it's going to be a combination of which codec you're using. The codec is not going to affect so much because you have the media engines that that play back real time those codecs. But as soon as you add effects on top of it, then it, that's going to CPU GPU, right? Uh, so the more nodes you have, the more masks you have, the more effects you have. For example, effects are pretty heavy. So I showed you the depth mask. If I try to play back that right now, uh, I still have the depth mask. Yeah, I still have the depth map uh, uh, applied to it. And if I try to play back real time, we can see up here 30, 13 frames a second, 10 frames a second. That's the depth map. If I switch it off, and then playback goes back to 30 frames a second. So effects of, uh, affect the performance of, of DaVinci. Uh, yeah. 
And and why, uh, this shouldn't surprise anybody. I mean, we're running highly sophisticated software on and, an iPad. And now that the chips now in iPads are highly sophisticated as well, but it gives you a, a hint of the future of the capabilities of some of our mobile devices. And but it's going to be the same thing as on yeah. on the computer. Uh, at some point, your computer is going to uh, is going to have troubles playing things back in real time, and for the iPad, it's going to be the same thing. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Everything, the software is getting much more capable and much more complicated. Uh, let's go to the next question. Roscoe Jones in Madison, Indiana. How good is the iPad display for color correction or colorizing? Is there any need for an external reference monitor with the iPad? Uh, Alex, or not Alex, but uh, Felipe. And then Alex has always talked about that, but I think he dropped well, off from it. So Felipe. If, if, you compare, if you compare to a reference display, you, you would still need a reference display. If you don't have a reference display, the display from the iPad is really good. A lot of colorists are going to say, obviously, you don't want to color for broadcasting for the big screen out of the iPad, but it's the, it's, it's the most common screen that there is in the world. Um, between your iPhones and your iPads. And this screen is an XDR screen to a thousand sustained nits with a thousand six hundred nits for peak brightness. Uh, contrast a million to one. Uh, if you put one little dot white in the middle of the <laughs> of your video, you're gonna see the uh, the dimming zones on on the iPad. But again. It's, it, it's a great screen to judge color. It's not a great screen if you compare to a reference display, obviously. Mitchell? Yeah, and my comment on that is that the Retina display is quite accurate. Um, it has got so much invested in it from Apple that uh, I guess you could use it pretty much as a color grading monitor because it's that accurate. Well, if your I goal it, is to Because I don't have a reference display. <laughs> yeah, but if your goal is to ship content that is going to be mostly consumed on iPads and iPhones and similar things, it is an extraordinarily good thing because this is the managed color pipeline that Apple built in was exactly for this. It says that if it looks this way on one iPad, it's supposed to look exactly that way on every other iPad on the planet, regardless of where you are or what you're looking at. So, um, you know, for broadcasts and other things that are not in the Apple eco ecosystem, and I would assume that Samsung and everybody else's displays at least understand this, there is so much weight on the Apple uh, color system that they have to be at least somewhat compatible with it. And you're, you're dealing with the biggest market out there, number of eyeballs. Let's hit the next question. Josh Kaufman, Pittsburgh, PA, asking, Felipe, can you comment on the type of workflow where you do quick or light editing on the iPad and then export the project file to a computer laptop for rendering. Have a Blackmagic design enabled a viable cloud workflow with Resolve 18. Wow. Um, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Uh, it's, uh, I will start by with one example of something that I did this week while I was testing DaVinci was I came in front of the camera, I recorded a video, and then I, I actually received It's Out of Focus right up here. But is this is the Infinity Gauntlet, the glove from Thanos, uh, from Infinity War, that he uses to, to handle the Infinity Stones in Lego. And I decided to, to film the assembly of that, uh, of, of that Lego. Um, that was all filmed in 8K, and it was a great thing to test Da Vinci. So that type of project in which um, you're going to have a few cameras, you might do a multicam, uh, but you also want to remain highly mobile. That's where I see doing some of this work on the iPad for me personally. And I, when I finished it, what, I've, what I did was, okay, I saved the project. I opened it on my computer through their cloud collaboration. Um, I double checked on the edit page because there are a couple of things that you can't do on the cut page that you can do on the edit page. Better works with uh, better work with with keyframes and so on. Uh, once that was solved, I trusted the color that I've done on the iPad because I finished that in HDR, and and I just exported from the computer because I on the computer I have an M1 Max with 32 GPU cores. That exports faster than the than the iPad. So I see 
a level of work, like Alex mentioned, hey, maybe you worked on, uh, you want to make sure that whoever is getting your media gets the color as you intended. So you're sending them log image, but with a lot or a grade already done on DaVinci. Uh, I think th this is all very interesting and it, it will all depend on how it evolves in terms of uh, stability with storage as well. Next question. Alex Fordy Golner in London, UK. Given that even Blackmagic doesn't have an infinite development budget, would you rather they spend money improving Resol Resolve for desktop platforms or spend money making Resolve for the iPad more full-featured? Ooh, a loaded question. Uh, Felipe, what's your, what's your opinion? Well, I think the work that they've probably been doing the past few years allowed them to have a single code base that they would easily be able to add things into both platforms. So I would say that I, I trust where they're going because they've been doing <laughs> very good things on, on, on this area for quite a while. And uh, whatever they do in partnership with Apple and the Apple hardware, will continue to, to give us fruits. That will be for MacBook Pros, for the Mac Pro that's coming, for anything that's running on Apple Silicon. So in summary, I would say continue working on the code base and give us both of them. Uh, <laughs> I want, yes, please, I want it all. Uh, yeah. Next question. <laughs> Guy Cochran, Seattle, USA. What 8K camera is Felipe using? Felipe, I'm using case? the Sony A1. Okay, shooting on a Sony A1. Asked and answered, next question. Roscoe Jones, Madison, Indiana asked, if you were teaching new Resolve students, are there reasons to start on an iPad? Uh, oh. Um, hmm. New Resolve students. No. And I will answer this in a with a summary of why I think what they've done with DaVinci for the iPad, it's important. They are the only NLE that runs on Linux, on Windows, on Mac, and iPadOS. Right now, all of them start for free, and then you can get more advanced features for not a lot of money. So it doesn't really matter in which computer or in each OS you are, you can use DaVinci. Right now, they are making a really good point in why not using DaVinci for your media management, for your editing, for your color, for your audio, and for your delivery, because it runs in all of them. So I think for someone starting right now, I wouldn't recommend them an iPad. I would recommend them to just get whatever it is that they already have, because it's, it's very likely that they already have a computer or something that runs iPad at this point, or that runs iPad, that runs DaVinci at this point. If they don't, then it's, they, they have a very low entry into, into being able to, to add it with DaVinci. That's congratulations to Blackmagic from my end. Yeah, this has been amazing. I don't, you know, we all thought about NLE on some sort of mobile device, but uh, the fact that Blackmagic has stepped up and come out with such a strong entry. Uh, not, and I, I'm not taking anything away from LumaFusion and the rest of that, but this is a different kind of thing. As people mentioned earlier, this wasn't an initiative to develop something from the beginning. It was to take one of the main NLEs that are out there that people do professional work on and make it an, a, a mobile friendly app. And I think they've done a stunning job. And Felipe, thank you so much for coming today and telling us about it. Uh, I, I, I started from zero and I now feel like at least I have a, a great grasp of where they do it. And we wouldn't be there without you. you know, Can I recommend thing? one thing sure, to anyone absolutely. that wants to start with DaVinci? Uh, watch Ripple training. They have trainings for DaVinci Resolve. They have a half an hour video on the cut page on YouTube for free. So that video basically allowed me to start editing on the iPad with Blackmagic because I only knew how to use the edit page. The cut page for me was very foreign. Then after I watched half an hour with Steve Martin explaining DaVinci, I was like, okay, that makes a lot of sense. So I recommend that. And again, thank you Blackmagic for allowing me to 
beyond the beta and allowing me to come here and share with you guys. And, and we appreciate them and you for taking the time to come and help us understand all of this. Uh, so we're close to the end. And in fact, let me get all the uh, last minute announcements in here. Tomorrow, New Year's Eve convention or New Year's conventions. What shows would you like us to cover? We're interested in your suggestions and your support if you want to do that. Uh, Saturday, don't forget education. Uh, John uh, uh, Corpio, looks like, co-author of Edu Protocol Field Grade Books 1 and 2, joins the Education Hour to discuss crafting an effective lesson plan. Uh, Sunday, of course, introspection here. Tomorrow, by the way, will be the last day to submit your 30-second self-video clips for the Kilo Show voting panel. We are less than two, no, less than a week away? Yeah, I guess it's, no, it's just a little more than that, about 10 days away from the big Kilo Show. Our 1,000th daily, not miss a single day show here on Office Hours. There are big plans. So that'll be next Monday, uh, a week from this coming Monday. And at that day, you really should stop in for at least part of it. I think we're going along and I think we're going to have a lot of talk. Uh, a lot to talk about. And if I understand things correctly, there will be a lot of look backs at where we started, where we came from, who's been here, who's no longer here. We can't cover everything, all, obviously, after we've done this many shows and had this many people involved. But we're going to take some time to reflect on what this has meant over the course of 1,000 daily shows. So don't miss that. Thank you all for coming today. Thank you again, Felipe, so much for being here and helping us with all of that. We are not going to forget everybody who makes this possible, all the panelists who are here today to help us, the producers, uh, those of you who are watching and, and, and enter questions, and of course, the staff and back-end people. Please watch the credits and acknowledge the people who do so much work here. Thanks for watching. Be back to see you tomorrow. Felipe, really good to see you again, dude. Thank you. You look like you're having it was fun. So cool. <laughs> it's so exciting, isn't it? It is. Now, again, the question, do you have all your boxes unpacked yet? Oh, yeah. Thankfully, yes. It you was do. Hard. A month unpacking everything. Uh, you got it done in a month. I hate you. <laughs> yeah. I still I still have boxes affected from my last book. I hate boxes. I hate walking <laughs> around and seeing boxes. <laughs> Interesting. Be well, I'll see you. Thanks, Felipe.